What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Three and Out YouTube page. I'm John Middlecoff, and we are talking football all day, every day. Make sure you subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends. Let's roll, baby. What is going on Sunday night football? Everyone's hating on the game. Call me a, a sap for old school, ugly football where guys are just getting crushed. I enjoyed it. Uh, the Texans beat the Bears 19-13 to in what felt like a one-sided blowout, but somehow the Chicago Bears cover. And I, I think the story of the game um, is Caleb just getting the living you-know-what kicked out of him every single play. Uh, and then when he wasn't, some balls were kind of flying all over the place. The Texans, my preseason number one seed, uh, as a gambling standpoint, too, get them eight to one on DraftKings, are looking pretty good. And it crossed my mind, could they win their division by Thanksgiving? Because the Jags are 0-2, Colts have a lot of issues, and are also 0-2, and uh, the Titans obviously have no quarterback. So I, I would say the Texans uh, are just playing for seeding early on because they're really, really good. We can dive into them as well as what we're going to do every Sunday night, a little overrated, underrated from the weekend. A lot happened. Went on with Colin right after the afternoon games. Uh, talked a lot about different stuff on there, especially about the Bengals, the Chiefs. Um, yeah, so go, go check that out. But we will bang out some football thoughts from Sunday night and some other stuff from the day that we missed. But before we do that, that game looked fun to be at. You know, the Texans, if you live in Houston, you've been a Texans fan. Uh, you had a little run there with J.J. Watt, but it's been tough. It's been a tough couple years. The Deshaun Watson transition, obviously firing coaches. But if you're excited about football, this is a team that I'd want to go see. And if you have a team that you want to go see, I got you covered. Because game time, uh, they're not just the official ticketing app of this podcast. They're a ticketing app I've been using for years, and I've used a lot of ticketing apps, and they are by far the best. So if you want to go to a game, if you want to go to a concert, I saw on social media Jane's Addiction. I used to like when I was a kid, uh, got into a fight on stage. Concerts are fun. The band's not supposed to fight each other. But, hey, it's part of going to a concert. You never know what you're going to experience. So right now, here's what I need you to do. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use the code J-O-H-N, for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code J-O-H-N for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last-minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Like I said, in, in a world full of uh, offensive explosion, the rules are all tailored toward offense. I'm a sucker for two defenses just destroying people all night long. I know it can be ugly, and I know people get mad when we don't get points and quarterbacks are struggling, but every once in a while, I still enjoy that. So a lot of people are going to act like that game sucked. I was glued. That second half, the physicality of it, uh, you know, the Bears tried their best to match it from a defense. They just kind of ran out of gas. But the Houston, Dex the Houston Texans had like a late 2000s Steeler Raven vibe to them. And we shouldn't be shocked. I don't know. Their head coach is a former middle linebacker, rookie of the year, Pro Bowl level player from Alabama who played in the NFL for a long time, who then mentored under Kyle Shanahan with Robert Sala. <laughs> right? So, like, the guy is, uh, that's the type of defense he played as when he actually was on the field. And his team, now that he has better players, uh, looks to be a very, very violent unit. And one overall theme there was a moment in this game when Caleb Williams tried to get out of bounds. I thought a little nonchalantly. And a lot of quarterbacks around the NFL, because we don't have as many statues, right? We have a lot of guys that can move. Even C.J. Stroud, late in the game, there ended up being a hands to the face. It would have ended the game on a scramble. All these quarterbacks, beside maybe two or three, a 40-year-old Aaron Rodgers off an Achilles, Kirk Cousins off an Achilles, and Jared Goff's just slow relative to NFL players, Every guy runs, and every guy's mobile. And there have never been less guys who slide. And when you're going to the corner on out of bounds, 
you have to run to the out of bounds line. Get out before you can get touched. Because these defenders, they don't get to hit anybody nine months a year. And then during practice, they're not allowed to touch you or make tackles. So, yeah, the violence of the sport is no longer what it was 15 years and then previous before that. But these guys have never been faster. And when you play teams like the Texans, they will knock you into yesterday. And I think sometimes these quarterbacks, I don't know if it's not being coached, but the lack of sliding and the lack of protecting yourself, to me, is getting a little outrageous. And last year, we had a record number of guys getting hurt. These guys, guy like Caleb Williams, there are certain times, obviously, when he's getting blitzed, nothing he can do. But when he's scrambling around, he's got to be cognizant of these guys and get out of bounds. Because his offensive line, and Collinsworth said it, I was eating dinner in the third quarter, and he's like, D'Amico Ryan's blitzing more than he ever does. And when he doesn't, Caleb Williams is 11 for 12. Well, what is a good coach going to do? He is going to do something over and over and over if it's working. And clearly the blitz was working. And the Bears' offensive line was completely overwhelmed. And the Texans' team speed, it looks to me to be pretty elite relative to the rest of the NFL. And one way that you can you know, feel comfortable blitzing is when you have good cornerback play. Well, the Texans have Derek Stingley, who is going to be a hundred-plus million dollar player this offseason. Uh, Lassiter, they just drafted pick 42 from Georgia, who looks to be pretty sweet. So they feel very, very good about their two outside starting corners. And they're like, okay, well, our two guys can cover on the outside on the corners. Keenan Allen is in street clothes, so you're not going to be able to get basic over-the-middle slants, ins, just dump-offs to him. And we're going to blitz you all night long. And that's what they kept doing. And I'll give Caleb, who, polarizing player. And through two weeks, he has missed a lot of easy throws relative to the hype. There was a throw tonight on like a deep out route that even Collinsworth said, you could tell by DJ Moore's body language, he wasn't happy. Happy. Why? Because he was open. And the ball wasn't even close. So there have been balls flying all over the map with Caleb Williams. He threw a couple awful picks tonight. Now, granted, one pick came after he broke a tackle, had his jersey ripped, rolled to the right, and then he threw into triple coverage. That if the ball would have been completed, it probably would have been the throw of the year because it's borderline impossible and it was an easy interception. He also threw a pick when there was a one-on-one ball to DJ Moore with Derek Stingley, who is... For my money, the best corner currently in the NFL, who made a great ball, high-pointed it, and picked it. So Caleb is making some bad passes. But I do think one major question mark with the guy was like, ah, he's kind of Hollywood. He's kind of a diva. Most people assumed he was kind of soft. And listen, whether they assume you're soft, whether they think you're tough, regardless what the perception of you is as a player, once you get to the NFL and are playing in games like tonight, Sunday night against a team who might win 14, 15 games. None of that means anything. You either are or you aren't. And he was getting fucking molly whopped. He was getting crushed. And I, I don't pretend to know all their plays or their protections. It's on the offensive line. Maybe some of the stuff's on him. I don't know. But he was getting destroyed. And he got up every single time. So does the hype, based on the last couple years of this player that was a lock number one overall pick that a lot of people thought was going to take the league by storm. It has clearly been a major challenge. Just throwing the ball to his wide receivers or tight ends. He has struggled to complete passes. But I think he answered the toughness question mark tonight because I think through two weeks, no one has been hit harder start to finish in a game than Caleb Williams just was. And on that final drive, he was, I, I mean, I, I thought he's not going to get up. And he got up. <laughs> and he ran another play. And then he got hit again. And I, I do think that he earned some credit just from a toughness standpoint around the league with his team. So you cannot, you have no chance in the NFL at quarterback if you're not tough as nails. You, you, you really don't. If you get skittish in the pocket, if you're afraid. And we have a long history of guys either 
getting gun shy over the course of hits throughout their career. And that's something that clearly the Bears are going to be have to be very cognizant of to protect this player, but also being scared before it even gets to that point because they don't want to get touched. And I saw a guy tonight who just was not scared. Now, he also wasn't good enough, even remotely close. And as the blitzes kept coming, it felt like it overwhelmed him a little bit in terms of where to go with the ball, what to do, how to get rid of the ball. But just from a pure toughness standpoint, I thought he took, I mean, to me, the Texans are right there with the Chiefs right now as the best-looking defense in the NFL. I would have thrown the 49ers in there after last week, but you can't do that after a day against Minnesota. But just in terms of every single guy, all 11 guys at any moment could, like, break your chin strap in half, that's what the Texans were rolling out. And their front six, seven guys who were coming from every angle were not just hitting him, they were, like, lifting him up in the air and landing on him. And he was getting up. So I was pretty impressed with that element of the game. Now, I understand the pushback going to be, like, when you watch these two players, CJ, who the Texans are just better, but CJ's just a little more under control. And his quote-unquote, and this Caleb did this a little bit tonight, tried to play the hero ball. And I think sometimes when you try to play the hero ball, that's where you get in trouble. That's why you throw the hideous interceptions. Where CJ, even when he scrambles to keep a play alive, it's like he's much more under control. Tank Dell had one kind of beelining down uh, uh, down the middle of the field that he dropped. Beautiful pass. He hit another one to Nico Collins down the side. And uh, listen, C.J. Stroud is just an elite player. Like he, That's a top five quarterback. That's easily one of the best players in the NFL. And I think you saw the stark difference of one guy, a lot more experience, a lot more under control, under duress, and another guy who was taking a pounding and kept getting up, but would kind of short circuit and make just some horrendous throws, killer throws. You can't constantly turn the ball over and have a chance. And now that's two weeks in a row where he has had some openings and some big play potential and missed. And CJ tonight had some big plays and made them. Now, it's a huge loss to not have Keenan Allen for the Bears. Just like when you look at the Texans, and I, I put this out on the old Twitter machine tonight, Nico Collins is becoming Mike Evans 2.0. He's 6'4", 215, 220 pounds. He runs a 4'5", or actually a 4'4'5", and is becoming a dominant wide receiver. And he makes less than $24 million a year. To go along with Tank Dell, who's CJ's best friend, and Stefan Diggs, who has transitioned pretty well to the Texans. And Joe Mixon, who looks like he's pretty good. Like, the Texans' offense is everything I thought, I think, that people believed the Bears' offense was going to be. Now, the difference is, is like, CJ's just a dramatically better player right now. But I, I think everyone needs to keep an eye, like, Nico Collins is on pace to catch like 90, 100 balls and have another 8 to 10 touchdown season. And physically, his body type, now he's slower to develop. Mike Evans was a top 10 pick. He was not. And he's a little late to the scene guy. He kind of broke out his third year. But I'm telling you, keep an eye. this guy's a star player in the making and going to be one for a long period of time. Because you put him in that offense, like, what are you going to do, double team him? Tank Dell's getting open and Stephon Diggs is getting open. So the Texans are not only potent offensively, and, and the Bears are good on defense. And the Bears a lot like the Texans. To me, their front four is really good. Their secondary is awesome. Their physicality, just in terms of tackling, is awesome. Uh, they just have a much better plan. I mean, I would take Bobby Slowick over Shane Waldron any day. I think sometimes... You can get a little pass happy, which the Bears clearly did tonight. Sometimes I think offensive coordinators are too quick just because you get stuffed on first down to get away from the run. I understand it if you're down 20 points, but it's when it's under 10, like help your quarterback out. You're going to get him killed. And, and I think the Texans just have more layups in their offense. And they're just more at ease with their personnel. They've been playing together longer. 
it's going to be a tougher transition for the Bears. I had this question uh, last week in the mailbag. Like, what can the Bears do to get an easier offense? Well, you just, one, you got to be able to run the ball. Because when you run the ball, you make it way easier on the quarterback. And two, you have to find a way to get some quick hitters. Not everything can be a deeper breaking route. So whether it's just even a wide receiver screen, uh, uh, you know, three slants, three outs, do something that's like three step out of his hand. And worst case scenario, a guy's not open, throw it over his head. But every time tonight as the game went on, it felt like they were having him hold the ball. And when he holds the ball longer, more can go wrong. Because he's not in control like CJ. So whether CJ gets rid of the ball really quickly or is forced to hold the ball a little bit longer, he's going to make a much better decision. Because currently, he's a much better player. But overall, I, I mean, I think the Texans... I mean, what's their high end? 15 wins? Crazy part is, what's their low end? 12? I, I mean, I think you're looking at a 13, 14 win team, uh, you know, depending on how long the Chiefs, like, can the Chiefs keep their focus for 17 weeks? Clearly, if they try every game, they're a 14 win to team too. But when you've just won two Super Bowls, when you've proven the last couple of years, you can have some mental lapses and still get by. It's really all about January. The Texans are a team that are still trying to prove themselves. Still trying to like, hey, we're here. Take us seriously. And sometimes teams like that, it's why I like them to get the number one seed, are just going to try harder consistently. And the division is pretty terrible. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it might not be very good. So big win for the Texans. Uh, rough couple weeks for the Caleb stats. But I do think tonight was a win just from a toughness standpoint. Because you do have to earn that in the NFL. Because there's going to be a time in a game like tonight where you are just getting crushed. And like, you know, in the octagon, are you going to tap out? Because anyone that's been watching football long enough, we've seen young players like, yeah, he, he don't want it. He don't want I don't blame him. I, uh, you and me, most human beings wouldn't want it. That's why a small, small percentage of people in this world can not only do that, but do it at a high level. Because you have to be good and you have to be tough. Caleb's not good yet. But I did think tonight he proved some, he got some toughness brownie points. Touchdowns. PD. Huddy. Take it into the house. In for six. I like to call it a tug. Whatever you call touchdown, one thing's for sure. Touchdowns matter more at DraftKings Sportsbook. An official sports betting partner of the NFL. On the ground, in the air, special teams or defense. We do not care how you score them. We just want to bet touchdowns. And DraftKings Sportsbook is the number one place to bet touchdowns. Ready to place your first NFL bet? Try betting on something simple like a player to score a touchdown. Go to DraftKings Sportsbook app and make your bet today. Ready to do a touchdown dance of your own? I know I do it all the time. New DraftKings customers bet five bucks to get 250 in bonus bets instantly and get one month of NFL Plus Premium. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use the code JOHN. That's code J-O-H-N for new customers to get 250 in bonus bets when you bet just five bucks and get one month NFL Plus Premium. Only on DraftKings, the crown is yours. Let's do a little uh, overrated, underrated from the day. Uh, we did this last week, I thought. Let's just do it again. Let's start with underrated. I think we might have underrated how terrible the New York Giants are. We all thought they were bad. They all got made fun of by any human being that watched Hard Knocks because of the Joe Shane uh, interactions with the owner, the Saquon situation, how just kind of uh, cavalier they talked about free agency when he's like, yo, yo, Dabes, what are you thinking for free agency? It's like 24 hours before it opens. It was weird. They're terrible. They they really are. I I feel sick because I like them today. And I bet on them today. Obviously, not only did uh, they not cover the two points, they lost outright. And uh, I watched a lot of that game. Sad to say. They were thoroughly outplayed. 
the commanders went 0 for 6 in the red zone. 0 for 6. They must have had 17 offensive line offsides in those situations. They kicked seven field goals and won 21 to 18. If the commanders just score a couple touchdowns in those situations, this game is not remotely close. When you look at the time of possession in this game, the commanders had it for more than 15 minutes more than the Giants. They got worked. Dayball was kind of getting edgy after the game, being asked about going into the game with an injured kicker, uh, his job status. It's ugly. And it's going to get uglier every time they lose. And somehow the Eagles play on a different night by themselves in front of the entire country. If you don't think Howie Roseman wants the Saquon move and Jeffrey Lurie and Nick Sirianni to look extra good, I heard Jason Kelsey tell Rosillo this. There are going to be less tush pushes, more than likely at the goal line, unlike the previous years where some of the running backs, anyone knows this in fantasy, if you had an Eagles running back, he got screwed out of a lot of touchdowns. Why? Because Jalen got him. I think Saquon's going to get some of those. So tomorrow night, in some of these situations, don't be surprised to see Saquon get a touchdown where he might not have previously in that situation with the Eagles. He's going to have a massive year. The Giants are not going to win many games. They're in, I, I thought there was no way they'd be bad enough to have the number one overall pick. I, I think it's in play. If you can't beat Washington, who I don't think is very good either, and they just thoroughly outplay you just because they have a rookie quarterback and you know bad offensive linemen, they don't know what they're doing in the red zone yet, you got very, very lucky this game wasn't 32-18. to 18. I might have overrated Bo Nix. Uh, I bought into the hype. Listen, like I said, I, I'm not Belichick here. I, I, I don't, you know, throw water over the flames. I like to throw a little gasoline and kerosene on it. I like them to be bigger. I like buying into it. And sometimes I'm right. You know, Saints, we'll get into it in a little bit. Sometimes I'm wrong. Bo Nix has looked horrendous. He was awful last week. And he, if he wasn't a top 15 pick, who clearly they want to be really good. You could have benched him today. He was that bad. And I get he's playing the Steelers, who might have one of, if not the best defense in the league, and physical. Their team I left out with the Texans uh, and the Chiefs. Like They hit hard. Their pass rush is elite. He was completely overwhelmed. He he was really, really bad. And there was a viral clip of like him in the huddle and Sean Payton, who has historically, or I guess famous... Uh, he's famous for his long verbiage on his play calls. And Bo Nix has listened to play call. And then he goes down to a sheet. And then he has to listen a little bit more. And everyone's it's like, Sean, your quarterback's not playing well, but your crazy offense with 8 million words for one play, like you got to figure something out. You got to meet in the middle because this is not going well. It's one thing to lose. It's another, they, they never had a shot. It's not like the Steelers are scoring 40 points. I mean, they're struggling to get 13 points. They barely score touchdowns. They scored their first touchdown today. Because last week, all they did was kick field goals. But Bo Nix, man. These rookie quarterbacks. uh, Jaden actually was better today. Now, granted, he's playing the Giants. And he clearly can run. Caleb a little overwhelmed. And and Bo Nix has been the worst. Bo Bo Nix has been the worst. That, that That was really, really ugly. I mean, they were lucky to get six points today. (laughs) <laughs> they, they, they felt closer to a goose egg than 10. Um, underrated. I was leery on the Ravens coming into this season because I'm like, well, you lost some players. Your offensive line's a major question mark. You lost the defensive coordinator. And then today, I look up. They're up 10. Like 12 minutes left to go in the fourth quarter. I'm like, you know what? The Raiders have played really hard. Minshew's you know, played a solid Gardner Minshew game. Their defense is playing their balls off. Tip your hat, try to cover the spread, lose the game. Then all of a sudden, they kick a field goal, they get another stop, they score a touchdown, then they kick a field goal to win the game. And the Raiders knock the Ravens to 0-2. They just showed a graphic on Sunday Night Football. Jim Harbaugh 2-0, John Harbaugh 0-2. I don't like what I see out of the Ravens at all. 
I I I, I might have underrated. Like I thought they, you know, ten ish win team. Like I don't know. This thing could get weird because I don't really like the Raiders either. Though they have a good defensive line, the Ravens' offensive line is not good. That creates problems. Minshew, you know, Devontae had his best game in a long time. That's an awful loss. Like I said, people are going to lose games. You don't go undefeated. Hasn't happened in 50 years. When you have a 10-point lead in the fourth quarter at home, and you have the MVP of the league, you were the reigning number one overall seed, and you're playing a team that didn't know who their quarterback was going to be three weeks ago between Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell, that's a horrendous loss. And it's a good win for the Raiders. And now the Raiders play the Broncos. Um, kind of an intriguing game. I'm I'm definitely interested to watch that one next week. Overrated. The 2023 quarterback class not named C.J. Stroud. I bought into the uh, Anthony Richardson hype. I wanted to pick the Colts over the summer to win the division. Then I watched the preseason, and I was a little scared because balls were kind of flying all over the map. I'm like, ah, I can't pick you to win the division over C.J. Stroud when your quarterback is not accurate. And then I told Stucky on Thursday, under no circumstances could I bet on a team. I don't care how crazy the line movement was. I understand they're at home that is starting Malik Willis. And then I watched Malik Willis and Anthony Richardson play a game against each other. And when the game ended, it was not debatable that Malik Willis, who has been on the Packers for about three weeks, looked better than Anthony Richardson. He threw one of the worst picks of the day. Off his back foot, airmailed it over wide receiver, hit the safety in the bread basket. It was an embarrassing performance. It, it, it really was. And like CJ, or excuse me, Bryce Young was awful again today. I think we've all come to grips. Nobody thinks he's good. No one even thinks he's that talented. Small, not a big arm, doesn't move that well, does nothing. Like what is his defining characteristic? You watch Anthony Richardson last week against the Texans. Went 9 of 19, but might have thrown the best individual pass of the year. 70-yard bomb off his back foot. And another awesome touchdown pass. I'll never forget when I worked at Fresno State, Pat Hill used to harp on us in the recruiting office. I I don't do highlight tapes. Because a highlight tape can make any kid look like he should go to Alabama or USC. Give me the three games that he played against the best teams on the schedule. Evaluate them off a game. A highlight tape does not mean anything in terms of how good a guy is as a player. And you can make an Anthony Richardson highlight tape over the couple games he played as a rookie and then over the first game against the Texans that make him look like Cam Newton meets Patrick Mahomes. And then you just watch him play a game and you go, I don't know if this is fixable. And I'm not a hater. I want to see him do well. But he is so inaccurate. And listen, if I had to choose between the two players, I wouldn't hesitate. I'd rather have Anthony Richardson than Bryce Young. But there is a chance that Anthony Richardson's inaccuracy and lack of touch is not a fixable thing. Because today in Lambeau, it was embarrassingly bad. It really was. And I I like Shane Steichen. I I think he's, like most people, an excellent offensive head coach. But I don't know if there's much he can do. So somehow the Texans find themselves at the top five quarterback. And the Carolina Panthers have to be thinking, like, is this – when are we going to bench this kid? And the Colts have to be thinking, we got a serious problem on our hands because our quarterback is all over the map. eBay Motors is here for the ride. You know, the first car I ever got, I was 16 years old, and my grandpa gave me a ride. And like any young lad who got a car that, let's face it, would not have been my first choice, I had to touch it up a little bit. And we tinted out the windows. We added a big subwoofer to the back. And you could hear me from miles away coming home. My my parents sure loved me for that one. So did my neighbors. But I I think the key to any young person getting a car is to personalize a little bit. Because you're probably not going to get your dream car. 
And as you get older, you know, you kind of become a car person or you don't. But you definitely have preferences, right? Some of us like bigger cars. I know I do. I've, I've only had big cars, SUVs. And uh, there are certain non-negotiables. I, I just like, I like three rows of seats. Now, ideally, I don't have kids right now, so I take out that third row of seat and I like a big, you know, I, I like a lot of trunk room. Some people, you know, don't like SUVs, like smaller cars. I, I've never been that big since my high school car of tinting the windows. I don't care if you see me or not. But I know some people, like, the first thing they do is tint the windows. It's crazy. The older you get, you know, I, I had to have the subwoofers. I, I The subwoofer, I couldn't listen to music for five minutes with the subwoofer like I did when I was younger. But th there is something very, very special about that first car. I don't care how many cars you get since, how much money you make to get sweeter cars. You never quite forget that first ride and uh, some of the memorable moments that you had in it in your high school years. So with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof rack bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay guaranteed fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Underrated. This guy actually individually might be the most underrated player in the league. Partly because he's been a little bit out of sight, out of mind. He was injured last year for a large percentage of it. I do think the video game thing became such a story, and rightfully so. I mean... We didn't make that up. They put a clause in his contract. Can't play video games. We need you to study. I And I told this to Colin. I think Kyler might be one of the most physically gifted athletes I've ever seen in my entire life. Especially just pound for pound, given his size. Right? Like, I, I, I'd put on a short list, obviously, like LeBron, Shaq, right, Dion, Bo Jackson. This guy is a freak. He's tiny. I mean, relative to NFL players and quarterbacks, he is really, really small. Yet his arm strength is elite. His deep ball accuracy when he's in a rhythm is awesome. His speed and quickness is off the charts. I've watched some of his press conferences, partly because sometimes I'll just have like, you know, TV on in the background. It'll be local TV here in Arizona. I do think he's matured. And I, I say this all the time. Like, as someone who can relate, like, I matured a lot in my early to my mid-20s to my late 20s to my early 30s to my mid-30s. Like, we're guys. We don't mature as fast sometimes. I mean, it's part of the package. And I watch Kyler Murray, and listen, I'm not acting like he's going to the Hall of Fame because he's a roller coaster player. But when he's on, as he was today, he's as good as anyone in the NFL. He's a dominant player. Now, how many times during the season can he play at that level? Probably not all, you know, might be one or twice the rest of the year. But can he just play at a high level for another half the games? Because if he can, that offense is pretty underrated. Marvin Harrison, probably going to be pretty good. Trey McBride, awesome. James Conner, pretty sweet starting running back. So I, I think the Arizona Cardinals offense, sneaky underrated. And just a unit not many people were talking about, though, like in fantasy circles, you were talking about the individual players. But as a unit, they didn't get nearly as much hype as a lot of other teams. I've watched them through two weeks. I can't imagine being a defensive coordinator going against them. They, they would give you a lot of headaches. Overrated. I still believe Dallas is going to be good. And you guys know where I uh, fall on the Saints. But that wasn't ass kicking today. And Dallas, every time you're feeling good about them, and they, they have fooled me so many times over the last couple of years, they just do that to you. That, that game was over midway through the second quarter. Nothing was more relevant than what happened in the second half of the, that game. It was 100% over at halftime. And the defense got absolutely shredded. 
Dak threw just a hideous interception over the middle of the field. And they got curb stopped. Now listen, Dak, very mature after the game. Like, no one's going undefeated. We get it. And you could have a great season and lose five times. God, they have some games like that though that just make you scratch your head, especially at home, home opener. Jerry can't be happy tonight. Underrated. If I would have told you that through two weeks, three of the best quarterbacks in the NFL would be Derek Carr, Sam Darnold, and Baker Mayfield, maybe you would have believed me on Baker because he had a good year last year. He got $100 million, and he plays with, I mean, Godwin and Mike Evans are two of the better wide receivers in the NFL. Definitely two of the better, you know, combo, one, two. Those guys have been awesome. Uh, Derek, this is why I like the Saints. He was going to work in this offense. Their defense is good. Derek, most of his career with the Raiders, had one of the worst defenses in the league. I mean, the Raiders' defense during his tenure was hideous. But when he's had good players on offense, a couple years he had Crabtree, Mari, uh, Latavius Murray, James Cook. Like, they've had good pieces. He put up good numbers. They have good players on offense. Alvin Kamara, Chris Olave, uh, Sheen, number 22. Taysom Hill, I think, had to go to the hospitals for something, but something with his chest. He's really good. If their offensive line plays well, this is a lock playoff team. We know Baker. I mean, the Bucs have been to the playoffs four years in a row. Look like a playoff team to me again. I mean, that division, like both those two teams look like playoff teams. I would say not the most stunning thing of all time because people talked about it coming into the season, how good Sam Darnold could be for the Minnesota Vikings. He's been way better than I would imagine. It's one thing to do it against the Giants. They're clearly terrible. He dominated today. He threw one terrible pass. I wouldn't even say it was terrible. It was a great play by Fred Warner. But he made countless big-time throws today. I mean, the the 97-yard touchdown, it wasn't great coverage. But he's backed up in his own end zone, throws an absolute dime to Justin Jefferson. He made multiple awesome throws on third down. He was really good today. And, like, that's what an NFL starting quarterback looks like. Now, whether big picture, if he continues to play like that, that means he's with Minnesota. But if he keeps playing like this, they're 2-0. and Like, what are you going to do? Just let him walk? Just because you got J.J. McCarthy who just hurt his knee? I think it could become very complicated very fast. But those three guys, uh, and specifically Derek and Sam, have been freaking awesome this season. Couple, couple more quick ones. Overrated. LSU, their defense. What's crazy to me, and I get the transfer portal has made things weird and you lose guys and it's harder to keep guys. Most of my life, even when LSU has had iffy offenses, like some of the less miles years, their defense was loaded with NFL guys. I mean, loaded with NFL guys. It feels like they have a mid-tier power five defense. Like, where are their NFL stars on defense? Especially at corner. They, they, they look slow. They easily could have lost the game. Obviously, their offense is pretty loaded with NFL talent. But I do not understand, when you have a transfer portal, when you have the ability to pay guys, how your defense can be this shitty when you're LSU. How is that possible? And, like, I want to like them, just because I, I like enjoying their players on offense. Two NFL tackles, NFL wide receiver. Uh, I, I root for Nussmeyer because I know his dad. But that defense... They, they, you have no shot at the playoffs if that's the defense you're going to play, the better teams that you play on the schedule. Underrated. Barbecue corn nuts. I, uh, today during halftime of the second game, I had to make a run because I needed, I just needed uh, actually some, some Zins. So I went to get, uh, I went to reload and I got myself a Diet Mountain Dew because I need a little caffeine. And then I was just like, I looked and I saw some barbecue corn nuts. I'm like, hey, I could use a little snack. They're fantastic. And it's just an item you rarely ever have. You could go like a, a year or five years. You just might not have it. You're like, I haven't had one of those since I was like 22. And then I just polished the whole bag within like five minutes. They're just fantastic. Uh, overrated. This is the last one. 
Rebel Ridge, the movie on Netflix that everyone is just hyping up. I watched it, and I'm a sucker for any action, cop against an innocent guy, people getting killed, you taking on a police force or the army or whatever. It was like a wannabe Rambo, but I thought it was pretty stupid and pretty cheesy. And I'm pretty easy to get to buy in on stories under that umbrella. And I just, it didn't do it for me. And I would say an underrated show movie documentary that I watched recently. If you like the the Sopranos, I would say the documentary on that with David Chase on HBO right now, the second episode that discusses uh, James Gandolfini and Tony and kind of him like being depressed and becoming Tony and quitting the show and holding out for more money is like as good of a 45 minute stretch as I've ever seen in a documentary that includes Michael Jordan's documentary. That includes some of the best 30 for thirties that like 45 minute stretch on David chase, who was basically like, Tony Soprano, the personality, and used Gandolfini and his struggles with it was fucking elite. I mean, I might watch it again tonight before I go to bed. It was that good. 